11. I'm going to start right on time. So my name is Dame Eleanor Von Atzinger, and I am um, interested in, honestly, a wide range of topics uh, within the, the period of the SCA. But one thing that I became very, very interested in were the more mundane aspects of the Crusades. And what I mean, what I mean to say with that is I started wondering about things like, how do they feed an army that big? What happens when you wear armor in a desert? You know, things like that, that had never really been talked about in a school. Now I am a school teacher. I will preface it with that. I do teach world history. And when they give you a curriculum as a school teacher, they're like, here's the things we want you to focus on. And what I started to find was they, <laughs> the things that they focus on are not incorrect, but they leave out so much. Uh, one of the things that I found that was really, really left out were the roles of women uh, within the period of the Crusades and directly to the Crusades. So today we're going to look at instances of women's roles during the Crusades. And these are all sources that, um, that I was able to look through and, and, uh, and find instances of women and their roles. Some of them will seem like they are very, very small roles. However, they are not. Um, and I'm going to start this. Let's see if I have command functions. Here we go. So I will tell you this. If you ask a 16-year-old um, who has just taken a world history class how women were treated in the Middle Ages, what their roles were in the Middle Ages, you often get responses like, oh, they were closed up in their homes. They did not have jobs. They did not work in the fields. They did not, their, their primary goal was to have children and raise those children, or maybe not, depending on their status. Uh, and, and I do see a lot of that kind of answer with the students that I teach. When you ask them to describe the Middle Ages, you do get a very Hollywood-esque idea of the Middle Ages. And a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the kind of misnomers that are conjured and, and perpetuated by seeing the Middle Ages in history. For example, uh, when you ask them to describe their vision of what the Middle Ages looks like, if you, if you think about a scene, they're like, oh, everybody's wearing brown. Everybody's in brown clothing. They don't have any teeth. Um, they're, you know, they're out in the fields all day. And, and you know, now us, us sitting in here, uh, having been students of the Middle Ages through the SCA, we have a different idea. We have a different notion of what that's like. So what I started to do was I started to read literature um, from period sources that had to deal with the Crusades. And I started to look for even the smallest instance of where a woman might be found and what her role was. Now, I will say many of the sources that I was looking at were uh, ecclesiastic. Uh, so written through a very Christian lens and by men who were in, um, uh, who were priests, who were bishops, so on and so forth. Now, we miss a lot when, when that is the only source that we can find. You know, if we, if we write for, uh, as who we are, we tend to get the, that perspective of whoever that person is, whether they're male, whether they're female. Um, whether they are involved in the church, whether they are not. So it was my thought to try to look beyond that, to try to figure out what the rest of the story might be. Now, again, I'm going to preface this a lot with, I do teach um, AP world history and world history. Uh, and, and I wanted to show you this. This is a 29 second clip that is given to teachers to describe what women's roles might have looked like. And it is a funny clip um, during the Crusades. Okay, so I'm gonna play that for you now. I'm a crusader, sworn to win back Jerusalem from the Saracen Muslims, slaughtering them in the name of Christianity. <laughs> it's hard, dirty work. That's why when I go on a crusade, I always bring along an old crow. She might just be an ugly old woman I kidnapped from my village, but old crone can wash out even the toughest of stains. She'll even wash it too. And that's not all. Old crone will even find food and cook it for you. All right. So first of all, I think that clip is absolutely hilarious. 
Um, and I clearly need an old crone in my life because I am my own old crone in my life at this point. So now we do have instances of, well, grannies being snatched from their houses, okay, and taken on crusade. And, um, you know, it, it must have been really difficult to leave your home for, you know, years at a time and, and to try to take care of things um, that, that may be a an old crone would have taken care of for you, but I want to show you where there are other instances. So maybe if you um, have this perspective, we're gonna look through a little bit of a different lens. All right, so here we go. We're gonna look at a couple of period sources. Now this one comes from the first crusade. This is uh, Fauché of Chartres. And I have my sources all at the end of this PowerPoint. You can take a picture or, or whatever you want, but uh, it was really interesting. I really like to read his perspective. I've got to move my little window really quick to be able to see. So an excerpt from him says, the husband told the wife the time he expected to return, assuring her that if by God's grace he survived, he would come home to her. He commended her to the Lord, kissed her lingeringly, and promised as she wept that he would return. She, though fearing that she would never see him again, could not stand but swooned to the ground, mourning her loved one, whom she was losing in this life as if he were already dead. Now, I'm sure there were some swooning going on, okay? But there was also a different side. There was also a different side. There were many women who wanted to take up the cross, take up the sword and go on pilgrimage and or crusade themselves. So here are a couple more. Now, I was really impressed by um, uh, a book written by the author Susan Edg Edgington. She, her, her focus goes into how there is power in words, and they can not only be symbolic, but they can hint at or um, discourage people from something, even if they're saying what they want in a very encouraging light, okay? I'll give you an example. So in the first crusade, Pope Urban, uh, this is a piece of his speech, okay? He says, Whoever wishes to save his soul should not hesitate to humbly take up the way of the Lord. And if he lacks sufficient money, divine mercy will give him enough. Brethren, we ought to endure much suffering for the name of Christ. Misery, poverty, nakedness, persecution, want, illness, hunger, thirst, and other ills of this kind. Just as the Lord saith his, his disciples, you must suffer much in my name and be not ashamed to confess me before the faces of men. Verily, I will give you mouth and wisdom and finally great is your reward in heaven. So now this is from his speech, but there's a monk in the crowd. Okay. The monk Robert. And this is what the monk Robert says right after Pope Urban delivers this portion of the speech. He says that when the entire crowd, both men and women responded very enthusiastically, the Pope clarified that neither the elderly nor infirm nor those unsuitable for bearing arms should go on crusade. So the Pope got everybody jazzed up, men, women, and, and women saw the excitement here. They, they took on that enthusiasm and the Pope had to very quickly clarify, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes on to say, the enthusiasm for the new pilgrimage was such that already it was not a question of who had received the cross, but who had not yet done so. Now, this is an interesting thing as far as symbolism. A great many men sent each other wool and distaff, implying that if they exempted themselves from this expedition, that they would only be fit for women's work. Brides urged their husbands and mothers, incited their sons to go, their only sorrow being that they were not able to set out with them because of the weakness of their sex. So it's interesting to see, you know, how, how the monk Robert says, man, women were super enthusiastic about this. And the Pope had to be like, hang on, ladies, hang on. Okay. And then, and then the symbolism when, you know, you have men literally sending the, the wool and distaff, literally saying, if you don't go, you're not fit. You're only fit for women's work. So this is, this is interesting. And so I tried to pay a lot of attention to maybe what was being said between the lines, you know, making those inferences. Um, now, what I want to say is this, I just wanted to give you a little timeline of the Crusades, okay? And there's this idea of the Crusade as a pilgrimage and the Crusade as a crusade that I find 
pretty interesting. So in the beginning, the Crusaders were, were actually called Peregrini, okay? They were, they were pilgrims. And that's within the first crusade. And as it goes on, they become crusaders. Women were absolutely allowed to be pilgrims. They were allowed to go on pilgrimages. Now, sometimes they would have to be accompanied by uh, a man in their life. Sometimes if they went in group, not necessarily. So it's interesting to see this, um, to see this change from the idea of a pilgrim to the idea of a crusader. Um, there is an excerpt right here that says, husbands and sermon writers and givers of social advice might have thought it safer for women to remain at home, but others specifically, the keepers and promoters of saint shrines, the destination of most European pilgrims, had ample reason to encourage women to undertake sacred travel. What's interesting is you can actually see some of the pilgrimages, uh, some of the shrines, some of the um, uh, the places that were set up that people would go on pilgrimage to specifically, they actually encouraged women to take on the sacred travel. Um, maybe it was monetarily, maybe it was um, more a matter of the heart, but we do see an uptick in women wanting to go on pilgrimage here. Uh, and there are a couple authors who wonder how many went on pilgrimage or how many went secretly on crusade or maybe even not so secretly. So here's the deal. As I started combing through uh, different books about the crusades, I found four categories where we see women, where women are generally not acknowledged uh, in modern day history courses. I saw them as water bearers often. I saw them in support roles that might seem, again, not important, but we'll talk about the importance of the role when we get to that. You do see women as fighters, and it's not just one case. A lot of people say, well, there's always that one case. Well, nope, I found at least three. Uh, and then we do have women as ad advisors, especially um, higher, in, higher in social status, uh, women who are higher in social status. We do see them in the key role of advisors. So let's go ahead and look through a couple of these. So water bearers, here is an account. This is from 1097 during the Battle of Dorylaeum. You see women acting in the very important role of supporters. One woman also were on that day, oh, excuse me, our women also were on that day of greatest support to us. They brought drinking water to our fighters and ever comforted those who were fighting and defending them. Here's a second account. Uh, from a different source, a fifth crusade accounting describes women in the capacity of water bearers who carry fresh water for the infantry to drink. Now, yes, that was an entire book. And that was the only mention of women here. Hang on, I've got to move my grid. There we go. Here's a third account written by her brother, Thomas. It was said of Margaret of Beverly during the siege of 1187, like a fierce virago, I tried to play the role of a man improvising a helmet from a metal cooking pot, a woman pretending to be a man, terrified, but I pretended not to be afraid. She brought water to the men who were fighting on the city walls and was hit by a fragment of stone hurled by one of Saladin's siege engines. The wound healed, but she carried the scar. So these all came out of different texts, but it helps us to see the importance of the water bearer. And what is interesting is I often try to compare things to my time in the SCA. I don't know if you guys have ever been on a battlefield, whether in, in battle or not within, um, the, uh, within the structure of the SCA. I've done both. I've done water bearing and I have fought. And I can tell you that there was one point of time where I had fallen face forward. I was overheated and I literally thought, man, I could use some help right now. Lo and behold, I drug myself off the battlefield and there was the water bearer. And I literally, it was like somebody had swooped down to save me. Now that's just a personal inference there. But I like to think about the fact of how important this role is. How very important it would be to be able to bring fresh water to people who have, and guys, I was in armor 90 minutes that day, I want to say. Um, but for people who had been in that for the entire day. We know the importance of water. We know, you know, the importance that it um, has on the body and for the body. So it's interesting to see that mentioned there. I have had a lot of people say, no, it was squires. The Knights brought their squires. But here we have instances of where women are water bearing specifically and providing that support. Sorry, I have to keep on moving my 
thing down. There we go. So as advisors, here is an account in a letter to his wife written in 1098. So you have the Count of Chartres and he makes it very clear the importance of his wife's role. Now this is after I was able to find this, I actually found that this is um, a hotly debated and contested uh, piece of history um, because the Count is actually accused of um, essentially not, not really deserting the battle, but not being a super proponent of it. And he gets called a coward and he gets called weak a lot. Um, and this is only one of these um, accounts that we have between him and his wife. So the first account um, says, these which I write to you are only a few things, dearest, of many which we have done. And because I am not able to tell you, dearest, what is in my mind, I charge you to do right, to carefully watch over your land, to do your duty as you ought to your children and your vassals. This just really hit home to me, especially with the language. This doesn't sound like an account where he is the king of all his domain, if you will. It very much sounds like she is an integral part. I just look at how, I mean, he could have said, I charge you to look over my lands to do your duty, you know, that kind of thing, but he didn't. Very clearly it was yours as well. So the count acknowledges his wife's ownership of land and the responsibility of his vassals that he also refers to as hers. And you know, it just shows the the import of the task that she is doing. And in this case, it is literally running their property and ensuring that their people continue with their livelihood. Um, and this must have been a great responsibility. And if this is just one accounting, then you know that there are more because of how many um, uh, men, husbands, sons left on crusade. Here's a second account. This is from the 1250s. This is Marguerite of Provence. Um, she negotiated the ransom of her husband and took over making decisions and arrangements until she left uh, for the Holy Land. And likewise, she commanded the Crusaders defense from her childbed when her husband could not. She was giving birth. It is a really cool story. Uh, and it, she's literally giving birth. We're, we're negotiating ransom and commanding the Crusaders from her childbed, which is truly incredible. Um, I did not know a whole lot about Marguerite of Provence until I found this accounting and then I had to go look up everything about her. We're talking pretty incredible. All right, now, this is support roles. Here's an account for the during the Third Crusade. So it says, during the siege of Acre, a woman was filling in a defensive ditch around the city but was struck by a missile and asked her husband to bury her body in the ditch so that she could continue helping the siege even after her death. She's there with her husband. She is performing jobs within the sphere of the Crusades. She's not locked up somewhere. She's not back home. She's there with her husband. Here's the second account. It tells of a woman whose job was picking fleas and lice off the male soldiers. Again, we may think of this as a lowly task, but I can't imagine the comfort that that would bring to those people who were sweating in an armor all day. Here's a third piece of evidence. You have Blanche of Castile and Eleanor uh, um, of Aquitaine. Both of them filled very high role positions um, as regents and in governments, right? And what's interesting is that they had sons who were crusading and um, both of them actually uh, worked as advisors to their sons. Eleanor actually, during the Third Crusade, worked to negotiate the release of Richard I. Okay, this was big stuff. This was big stuff. And a lot of people will bring up Eleanor of Aquitaine and they'll be like, well, she was an anomaly, you know, and she was amazing. I, you know, when I read her history, I'm just like, wow, what a life, what a person. But but we see more. So it wasn't just high ranking women who were there. We have looked at um, three instances of, of women with all types of social status at this point. Um, one second, I'm gonna move some stuff around. Here is where things got even more interesting. 
So this is the Chronicle of Prussia. This is 14th century, okay? And this is coming from the Teutonic Knights. And this is a little lengthy, but I think it's pretty important um, to, to get the imagery, to get, to get the feeling behind this passage. Okay, so it says, Lord Swantipokas, Swantipokas, I always have to, I have to say it a hundred times. The leader of Palmerini became aware that his brothers and their people at Elbing had gone away. When the enemy of God heard this, he assembled a powerful army and marched on Elbing. Because there was no one there, he hoped to capture the city and the fortress without encountering any resistance. When the women of Elbing realized the danger of an attack, they all took off their women's garments and clothed themselves in the weapons and courage of men. They went out on the battlements and conducted the defense so bravely that none of these pure women gave any sign of cowardice. When the army saw this, they could all but have sworn that the brothers had returned with the men of the town. So the women manfully drove Swantipolkis away, excuse me, who retreated shamefully. This happened many more times in the country. When the men were away, many castles would have been lost to the enemy if it, they had not been defended by brave women in the guise of warrior. This made me, I was kind of like, I was geeking out so hard when I found this. And there were a couple of things that I realized. First of all, the way that it's said, um, there's a few things you you might have heard. Um, I know another uh, fallacy is that women who were there during the Crusades were camp followers. And be that as it may, and, and, and they probably were uh, uh, some there, they make let me see, where is that? Boop, 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 boop. They try to get away from that when they say these pure women. Oops, hang on. They literally say, they call it out, these pure women. So you might be thinking maybe women who are married. You could be thinking um, women who were um, religious in some way, perhaps nuns. Um, but they call it out here. They make it a point to say these were pure women. Um, and again, they instead of just saying that they were women who did something amazing, you do see a lot of it cloaked in. They uh, literally cloaked themselves in the courage of men. The women manfully drove away, Swantipokas. Um, so you will see that. You'll see that language put there again, uh, especially even at the end, um, uh, by brave women in the guise of warrior. As if women could not necessarily be warriors, but here they were in the guise of this, uh, of this uh, warrior state. So I think that one is pretty interesting. And here are a couple more. How do I get this to go back up? Hang on real quick. Go away. I can't see the first part of my sentence. That's okay. Um, so here we are with a couple more instances of women who are associated with battle. Now, guys, this one is a little bit violent. Um, and, uh, but, but I think it's important to see. So here are, here is literally, um, women taking up arms as violent accomplices. So our women pulled the Turks along by the hair, treated them dishonorably, humiliatingly, cutting their throats and finally beheading them. The women's physical weakness prolonged the pain of death because they cut their heads off with knives instead of swords. Again, um, implying that they're not necessarily warriors, but more like, you know, kitchen knives, uh, you know, but it shows that they were there. And here is something else important. I wanted to look for evidence from the other side. I think that is important. History is often very one-sided based upon the ideals and uh, visions of the person writing and where they come from and who they're supporting. So I wanted to look at the other side. So this is interesting. This is from Imad Alin's eyewitness account. And he says, there was a woman on one of the points of the defense holding a bow of wood, firing well and drawing blood. She did not stop fighting until she was killed. Now, this was literally, again, the only sentence that referenced a woman in the entire book. Um, and here is another. Uh, and this is Baha al-Din. And this is his, in his personal recordings, he speaks of a woman in the Battle of Acre in 1191. So he says, a knight, 14 Franks and a woman were in fact seen, captured and killed on Saladin's command. And yet another accounting, we look at the Chronicle of Ibn al-Ithir. Uh, here, the historian notes, most of the dead were Frankish knights. 
for the infantry had not caught up with them. Among the prisoners were three Frankish women who had been fighting on horseback. After they had been captured and their armor thrown off, it was discovered that they were women. Their armor. Okay, it just, and again, you, you don't, these are just little blips in, in these uh, accountings, but they're there, but they're there. And, and I think it's so important to, 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 to know that they were in fact there and not in the roles that were commonly told to us in school. OK, uh, this is this is my biography. So if, if you are interested in looking at any of these publications, feel free to snap a picture or a screenshot. Um, but it was very interesting and. And it was enjoyable. I, I do identify um, as a cis woman. And and so it was it was neat to see instances of um, womanhood found where I had so often been told that it was not. So again, you do see you do see the gendered language, you do see the gendered symbolism, um, but they were there, but they were there. And I think it's important to know um, that people that are not mentioned in in the books, in the sources, they were still there as well and and playing roles that we just might not hear about. So that is what I wanted to share with you today. And I appreciate you all for coming, but I didn't know if anybody had questions at this point. I may or may not be able to answer them just based upon what they may be. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed some of the information that you heard today and I appreciate you all coming.